my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive, six, seven, eight, feeling great. Hello and welcome back to Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. My name is Dr. Noah DeCoyer and I'm your co-host. Today our guest is none other than Yuri Elkame. Good morning, Yuri. Excited to have you on today. How are you? I'm doing very well, Noah. Thanks for having me. Great. Let, let me do your bio and then we'll dive, you know, we'll dive right in. Yuri is a nutrition, fitness, and fat loss expert and the New York Times best-selling author of the all-day energy diet and the all-day fat-burning diet. A former professional soccer player turned health crusader, he's most famous for helping people who've tried everything to lose weight and get in shape with little success, finally achieving breakthrough results. Yuri is on a mission to empower 10 million people to greater health by 2018 by making fit and healthy simple again. For more information, uh, right off the bat, you could check out yurielkame.com, Y-U-R-I-L-E-L-K-A-I-M.com. So first question, every guest, Yuri, for those few people who don't know who you are, uh, a little bit about your journey, how you became who you are, maybe some mentors along the way, something along those lines. Yeah, for sure. So I started my journey as a very active kid, uh, wanted to pursue a career in professional soccer from a very young age. And so I did that, uh, luckily in my early 20s for a number of years. But so leading up until that, I played and trained at the highest level for, um, for most of my teenage years. And the fact that I was very fit masked a lot of health issues that I was dealing with. So I had like eczema, asthma, uh, digestive issues, or really low energy. And I didn't really pay attention to any of those signs because I didn't know I didn't know any better at the time to be very, to be very honest. And uh, when I was just about 17 years old, my body sent me a stronger message. And this happened uh, just before my 17th birthday. Got home from soccer practice one night, taking a shower. All of a sudden, I'm washing my hair. I look, you know, kind of rinse things out. Look at my hands, and my hands are covered in hair. And so I'm thinking to myself, that's not normal. I've never seen this before. What is going on? And a long story short, in the space of six weeks, I lost all of my hair. So eyebrows, eyelashes, everything. And uh, obviously, my doctor, uh, after seeing him, said I have an autoimmune condition called alopecia, and where the immune system attacks the hair follicles. So that was kind of like the wake-up call from a health perspective to be like, hey, you should probably look into this and kind of figure this out. Because like, unfortunately, the medical doctors that I was seeing had no answers other than to inject my head with cortisone, which I said, no, thank you. <laughs> so uh, this kind of started me on this journey of trying to figure things out. And um, it didn't really kind of get the answers I was looking for until about eight years later when I went back to school to study holistic nutrition. So I'd finished my degree in kinesiology before that, and I still didn't know anything about nutrition. So I went back to school after I'd finished playing professional soccer to uh, study holistic nutrition. And that was a big eye opener for me where I started to uncover, wow, my diet was pretty terrible growing up. You know, lots of you know, the standard American diet, processed foods, junk foods, very few natural plant based foods. And my body was just polluted. It was just toxic. It was acidic. It was inflamed. And in my case, my body just revolted and went haywire. So when I started to understand that, I started to clean things up and started to make some really big improvements in my health and very quickly. I'm talking like overnight changes, especially with my energy. And my eczema and asthma really went away. Uh, my hair started to regrow and pretty much grew it all back. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I went to see my doctor with my oldest son at the time, and she recommended I get a tetanus shot, which for whatever reason, I didn't even... Uh, challenge, but I got it. And two weeks later, my hair fell out again. So anyways, long story short, all of these health challenges that I've kind of gone through have really um, propelled me into figuring them out for myself, but also realizing that there's a lot of other people suffering with their issues, whether it's weight, low energy, you know, any anything that, you know, people are dealing with, I'm on a mission to help them really end their suffering because I've gone through my own share myself. I've seen friends and family go through theirs as well. And I've just learned a lot of things along the way that um, I'm able to really impart on people in a way that is simplistic. And what I do really well is I really simplify health because uh, obviously, as you know, it's a very confusing world out there. And most people are very confused when it comes to what they should be doing. And I think what I really add to the equation is uh, a very authentic, pragmatic and simple approach 
to living a healthy and fit life. And my forte really is in having a lot more energy and helping people burn fat. Those are two of the big things that people turn to me for. So yeah, I started off as a trainer and nutritionist. Then I eventually kind of ventured online because I wanted to impact a lot more people. I uh, wrote three books, have helped over half a million people. I've been on the Dr. Oz show, the doctors, my YouTube videos have been seen by 26 million people. Um, so it's been an amazing ride and we're on a mission to help 100 million people by 2040. So it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun and it continues to be. You know, you know, we, we had a brief conversation before hopping online and you're just a wealth of knowledge and, and I, I think today we should focus on energy. You mentioned it several times. You helped me formulate some really great questions to guide this interview in, in the exact direction it needs to go. So let me start off with this, the first question. Number one, rarely discussed reasons why we're so tired all of the time. Yeah, so my, my take on energy is a little bit different from a lot of other people's. Um, what I discovered when it comes to energy is that Energy, if we think about how our body produces energy, it really boils down to what's happening at the cellular level in terms of like are our mitochondria able to extract oxygen out of our bloodstream and use that to produce energy. Um, I know that seems very technical and sciencey, but at a very basic level, if our cells do not get the oxygen they require, we're going to feel sluggish. They're not going to produce the energy in an efficient manner. They're going to turn to sugar metabolism or anaerobic metabolism to produce energy, and that's not the ideal state for our body to be in. So at a very basic level, if the body is not getting the, I should say not the body, but the cells that make up your body are not getting the oxygen they require to produce energy, we are going to feel sluggish. So with that said, how does that happen? How do we not get the oxygen we're supposed to be getting at the cellular level? Well, at a very fundamental level, Oxygen travels throughout our body in our bloodstream, and they travel on red blood cells, which are kind of the, the taxi cabs or the Uber cars of our bloodstream. And if you think about the oxygen molecules as the passengers, they have to go from our lungs to different cells in the body. But the problem is that most people's bloodstreams are kind of like Manhattan traffic, right? It's like a traffic jam, and the red blood cells are not able to flow freely because of the way we're eating. And basically what that means is that we're eating a diet for the most part that is very acidic that ends up clogging the health of our blood. And I don't want to go too sciencey on this, but basically when we eat a standard American processed junkie diet, things happen to our red blood cells that kind of cause them to stick together more than they're supposed to. And they're actually not supposed to stick together. Um, but what ends up happening is this kind of formation known as a rouleau. It almost looks like stacked poker chips. And if you think about your red blood cells as a stack of poker chips, they're not supposed to be like that. They're actually supposed to look like free-floating little donuts moving throughout your body. So if our blood is kind of resembling a traffic jam, then oxygen is not able to get where it's supposed to, to get to. And if our blood is a, if our blood is sluggish, we are going to feel sluggish as well. And the major reason this happens is because of the foods we're eating. So if we look at the most common foods that we eat, you go to Starbucks, everything you see in the display case, those are all culprits. Any fast food joints, any type of food that is going to deposit more of an acidic residue inside the body is going to be a big problem if it's not balanced out by alkaline foods, which for the most part are vegetables and fruit. So does that make sense without going too technical beyond that? It, it absolutely makes sense. And, you know, within the last year, I would say the, the health of the mitochondria has absolutely ex, it just exploded on the scene. That's what every functional medicine doctor is talking about, uh, metabolism, 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 and it's starting at the mitochondria. A, any thoughts about maximizing the way your mitochondria function? I think you're on that track. Yeah, I think there's you know, there's a lot of different things that people talk about. I think mitochondria has definitely been um, more of a buzzword as well in the biohacking space, where you know people are taking, you know, whether it's CoQ10 or different uh, different supplements to improve performance there. But to be very honest, I mean, there are simple things we can do, whether it's 
intermittent fasting or getting better sleep or even small bouts of intense exercise or just simply alkalizing our bloodstream to help our mitochondria perform better. And I mean, it's, it's like, the thing is like, I tell people how you heal anything is how you heal everything. <laughs> so if you want, if you want better performing mitochondria, just eat in a way that's going to improve your overall health, right? So if you want to prevent heart disease, prevent cancer, lose weight, have more energy, for the most part, the approach is almost identical. You know, there might be a couple of nuances here and there. And why is that? Well, it's not that like certain foods are proven to only deal with cancer or only help you have more energy. It's because they are blanket approaches to helping your body get back into homeostasis or balance where it is able to thrive and function at its optimal. And so it's not like, you know, blueberries have vitamin C, which are only good for this one specific thing. There's so many things we don't even know that these foods are doing to our body at these microscopic cellular levels that when our mitochondria are functioning better, when our cell membranes are healthier, all of these little things at a macro level end up helping us have better health, having more energy, allowing us to lose weight more easily. And that's, that, I guess, so that's kind of the, the way I like to approach things is really just kind of like this blanket approach that for most people is going to serve them. <clears throat> excuse me, is going to serve them no matter what it is that they're after. Right. So, you know, I, I preach a, a wide variety of fruits and vegetables, you know, and, and healthy, organic, grass-fed meats consistently to my patients. But mm -hmm. sometimes I think it's easier to, you know, target, like, what are the few things that you should absolutely avoid? So when, when a patient or one of your clients asks you, you know, what do I need to avoid immediately? What are the top few things that you say right off the bat you must avoid? Yeah, I mean, like, hands down, when it comes to energy, and again, energy, you can synonymous with health, um, caffeine, sugar, and wheat. I would say those are the three big ones. And you can, I mean, you can add in some of the allergenic foods like dairy as well to there, even soy. Uh, but two of the big ones, especially when it comes to energy, is, you know, people rely on caffeine for energy, and that's a problem. That's like, that's like saying, I'm going to rely on my credit card to feel wealthy. And, you know, so it's just a completely false way of approaching uh, the way we live. And it, like, the common saying that people have is like, you know, I need my coffee to get my day started. That is a big warning sign if you ever say that to yourself, because in no way, shape or form does your body require caffeine to function. Your body is just in a state where it's so bogged down by a bunch of stuff that you need a quick fix like caffeine to bring you back to life temporarily. And then before you go into a crash and then seek out more caffeine or sugar to bring you back to life. So the thing is, when we clean up the body, when we kind of resurrect its vitality, you don't really need things like caffeine or sugar because you have this natural, sustained, I'm not going to call it a high because it really isn't a high. It's more of a sustained, moderate amount of energy throughout the day that doesn't go up and down like if you're having caffeine or sugar. And it's much healthier. It's much better for your overall productivity and focus and obviously your overall health. Um, but caffeine and sugar have very similar effects inside the body. They wear down the adrenal glands. They wreak havoc on your blood sugar. And just those two things alone are detrimental from a fat loss perspective or just, you know, they will increase your body's tendency to gain weight. But they're also going to wreak havoc on your energy levels because you're going to go up and down with these energy roller coasters all day long. And we know that when blood sugar goes up and down, so does insulin. And when insulin goes up and down, that's a big um, uh kind of predisposing factor to higher amounts of inflammation inside the body and a bunch of other things. So those are two of the big ones that I would really recommend people avoid. Um, so if you're drinking coffee, move to a decaf at the very minimum. And um, over time, like as you clean things up, you won't even want the ca caffeine in the first place. And then looking at allergenic foods like wheat, dairy, because they are problematic at the gut level. They also stimulate inflammation inside the body. And um, none of that stuff's going to really help you uh, w with anything health-related. Totally agree. Now let's let's take the same perspective with exercise. When you're looking for what type of exercise is going to give you the biggest bang for your buck, and I think I know the answer, but I'd like to hear your perspective on it. Okay, so there's I'm gonna I'm gonna answer this in in two uh, two ways. So if somebody has, so I'm a huge fan of short bursts, higher intensity activity. 
because that's a great way to really get a lot of oxygen into your body, get a lot of muscles going, get your heart rate pumping. And when you have that, that pump, that feeling of that, that, that's, you know, people get into this runner's high type of, um, type of state. That's where you start feeling really good. And that's why people get addicted to exercise. So I'm a huge fan of that because you can get a lot done in less time. Um, and I'm not talking about like sitting on a bench doing bicep curls and then tricep extensions. I'm talking about doing, you can do a simple 20 minute circuit where you do a full body workout where you have maybe a set of squats, maybe some push ups, maybe some jump rope, maybe a plank, just full body exercises that get a lot of muscle involved and that are focused on movements, not specific muscles. You do that, you know, you take 30 seconds between exercises, you're going to be huffing and puffing, sweating, and 20 minutes will seem like more than enough time. Do that three, maybe four times a week, and it's an amazing plan to energize you and also help you stay strong and burn fat. So that's what I generally recommend for most people. However, if you're somebody who's dealing with adrenal fatigue, so somebody who's like adrenals are toast, like you can't even get out of bed in the morning, you feel exhausted after any kind of emotional upset, those are some hallmark signs of adrenal fatigue. And basically the adrenals, they help your body deal with stress. And if you can't deal with stress, that is an indication that your adrenals are kind of taxed. So if that's the case, then I would not recommend the type of exercise I just mentioned. If you have adrenal fatigue, you want to be doing very light, low-intensity, restorative type of exercise. So maybe that's going for a light bike ride or doing more yoga, doing more restorative type of stuff, like maybe just even walking and give your body time to really come back to life before you start adding in some of that higher intensity activity. So those are just kind of the two spectrums I just wanted to kind of put out there because if someone with adrenal fatigue does the high intensity stuff, they're going to feel pretty crummy. Yeah, for me, uh, the rhythm that I've found is that I, I do yoga at a studio three, ideally four times a week and two times a week I'm doing like some sort of high intensity exercise and that seems to be right on target for me. That's great. That's awesome. Now, now you, you mentioned adrenal fatigue, and that's that's one, a, a buzzword term. Any any further insights on adrenal fatigue? Because that that's confusing, and there's a lot of controversy on that concept or that thought uh, in and of itself. Yeah, I mean, if you go to your medical doctor, they're going to tell you you're crazy. It doesn't right. exist, right? And that that's unfortunate. So the reality is, like, if you feel exhausted, so there's I mean, there's a couple signs. Um, so basically a couple things that I mentioned before, if you have, if you feel really, really exhausted after any kind of emotional upset or anger, that's one sign or symptom of adrenal fatigue. Another one might be you just feel really, really tired and you have a tough time getting out of bed in the morning. And obviously there's overlap with these signs and symptoms with other things, but these are some of the big ones. Um, another one is you tend to crave salt quite a bit. And that's because aldosterone is one of the hormones that the, uh, is kind of regulated by the adrenals and it's not working as properly as it should if the adrenals are toast. Uh, but there's also two other little at home tests, tests you can do to give yourself a better indication if you might have adrenal fatigue before doing maybe a salivary hormone test or some more in depth panels with, uh, with your functional medicine or naturopathic doctor. So one of them, is a pupil, uh, a pupil dilation test. So what you can do here is take a flashlight or your iPhone flashlight, go into, uh, go into a bathroom, close the door so it's pitch black. And what happens in darkness is that our pupil will dilate. And that's just to allow as much light in as possible so we can see when it's not as light. So what you're going to do is you're going to kind of spend about 20 seconds or so in the dark, just allow your eyes to adjust. Then what you're going to do is you're going to look into the mirror and you're going to take the flashlight at a 45 degree angle to your eyeball and you're going to flash it or basically keep it on at your eye. Now what should happen is your pupil should constrict because now you have this huge influx of light. So now your eye doesn't need to take in as much. So it's going to constrict. Now in a healthy individual, so if the adrenals are working properly, that pupil should stay constricted for at least 20 seconds. If the pupil constricts and then starts to dilate or pulse back and forth, that's an indication that the adrenals are a little bit taxed. And the reason for that is because they are pumping out adrenaline um, or epinephrine, however you want to call it, 
to the little muscles around your eyes to stimulate those muscles uh, to contract. And if the adrenals are not working properly, they're not able to basically perform that function. So that's one kind of warning sign you may want to look for. Another simple one, honestly, like you could do this with a blood pressure cuff, but I don't think most people have a blood pressure cuff, so I'll just keep it really simple. Lie on a couch. Lie down on a couch for five, ten minutes or just watch TV or whatever. Stand up after you lay down, and if you feel like you're going to pass out, if you feel dizzy or lightheaded, that could be a sign that your adrenals are toast. I mean, that could also be a sign of low blood pressure, but part of that is also related to adrenal fatigue. Because if your adrenals are not able to uh, function as they're supposed to, they're not able to constrict those muscles because epinephrine or adrenaline is going to help constrict the muscles to bring blood back up to the top of your body, then obviously that's going to be another indication of adrenal fatigue. So the gold standard really is getting a salivary hormone test, which will you know run you maybe 150, 200 bucks. Um, but that way you can get a much better sense of where things are at with respect to cortisol, DHEA, and different hormones that are related to adrenal stuff. But um, just symptomatically, those little tests there can uh, can really help steer you in the right direction. Can, can you repeat that second test? You, you lay down and then you stand up. What did you say again? Yeah, so basically, um, formally, it's done with a blood pressure cuff. So okay. you would look at, you know, like it does a sigmometer drop a certain pr- uh, number of points, but I don't think most people have a blood pressure cuff. So I would say for most people, if you're just lying down for any length of time and then you stand up, do you feel lightheaded? And if you feel lightheaded, either you have low blood pressure or the adrenals or and or the adrenals might be a bit taxed. And um, again, that has to do with like, are the muscles able to uh, constrict properly with adrenaline being one of the hormones helping them do that? Um, is there enough sodium retention to, you know, maintain blood pressure? There's a couple of different things there, but uh, that's a really simple kind of indicator that something may want to be looked at. There's no doubt I'm going to do the pupil dilation test as soon as we get off this interview. All right, it's, it's pretty cool, too. It takes 30 seconds, and it's really cool. Yeah, that is. Now, the, the other organ that's associated with energy often, and it's a, pro, it's, a it's an epidemic, is thyroid issues. What, what are your thoughts on thyroid gland itself and how to maximize its function? Yeah, the thyroid, I mean, like, who doesn't have a thyroid problem nowadays, right? It's like everyone thinks they have one, or a lot of them do. Um, so the thing with the thyroid is that it's very closely linked to the adrenals. So if you have a thyroid issue, very often that will uh, it'll be preceded very often or in conjunction with adrenal stuff. So if the adrenals are taxed, eventually the thyroid will be compromised as well. Uh, there's a couple different things with thyroid stuff. A lot of times people have Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune condition that uh, attacks the thyroid. So that's one of the ways that the thyroid becomes compromised. Um, but it doesn't have to be autoimmune derived. It can be, you know, there's a lot of different um other mechanisms by which the thyroid can be compromised. The the issue with the thyroid is that the thyroid is the master metabolism gland. So it's the real um, air traffic control, if you will, for your metabolism. And it obviously works very closely with the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland in your brain. But if the signals from your brain are being sent to your thyroid and your thyroid's not receiving them properly or it's producing hormones, but it's not those hormones aren't being converted properly throughout the body. Um, there's a lot of the thing with the thyroid is that it's not just in the thyroid a lot of times, but there's so many different uh, weak links in the chain. There's almost, you know, probably almost half a dozen to a dozen different points whereby the entire thyroid, whether it's the thyroid hormone, the conversion process, the thyroid itself, the feedback loop, so many different things can uh, can really just kind of be off. And it's, it's not as easy as, hey, take some, you know, some Synthroid or some thyroid medication from your doctor. Cause if your doctor looks at your thyroid and says, hey, everything looks great. Well, that's just a small, that's like the tip of the iceberg. There might be things going on, um, underneath that, that might need to be, um, looked at a little more closely. So a couple things to look out for is, um, heavy metals, right? So lead, mercury. Those are two big ones that are associated with um, compromised thyroid function. So if you have any mercury amalgams, dental fillings, stuff like that from decades past, that we know is a, a strong correlation with thyroid issues. Uh, we also look at things like, um, uh, sorry, uh, seafood consumption. You know, again, tuna, things like, like some of the bigger fish that might have 
bioaccumulated toxins like mercury or lead over time. Um, and then like basically we want to look at cleaning up the diet as well because we know that gluten has a very similar protein structure to the thyroid tissue as well, which is kind of weird. So a lot of times when people have thyroid issues, one of the best things they can do is avoid gluten. Not only will that help seal and heal the gut, which will help if it's a Hashimoto's autoimmune condition, but just reducing gluten inside the body is going to reduce a lot of those antibodies that could be attacking the thyroid tissue um, based on this thing called molecular mimicry where the body gets confused between different protein molecules that look the same. So there's a couple things to avoid. But again, if you just fo like follow the basic premise of like cleaning things up, getting rid of the allergenic foods, and just really doing your best to, um, to live a clean diet as, as best you can, that's really the best way to start moving forward. And obviously healing and sealing the gut is going to be a big component to that. Yeah, <clears throat> totally agree. There's such an intimate relationship between gut health and your thyroid health, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, you sent this over to me, and I thought it was pretty fascinating. So I'm just going to read the statement, and I'd like to see what your answer is. Energy mm -hmm. through tranquility versus stimulation. Yeah. So I, I love how you mentioned like you do yoga four times a week because – there's a very big difference between the energy you, f you feel after, for instance, yoga or meditation versus the energy you feel after going for a 15-minute high-intensity run slash an espresso, right? And there's a, so both give you energy, but it's different. And what I really try to get people to think about is that, yes, exercise is important, but too much exercise will destroy your body. Um, too much yoga is never going to destroy your body. I mean, you might get too flexible, but that's not, not really the issue. Um, but what we want to think about is how do we energize ourselves through tranquility? And basically what we want to think about is there's two systems in the body. We have the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And all of the stuff, all the disease, all the stress stuff, all that stuff we want to avoid is associated with the sympathetic nervous system. And that's where most people live. High stress, very shallow breathing, go, 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 type A personalities, lots of stuff going on. You know, they can't even slow down. Parasympathetic, which is basically a relaxation, is associated with all the good stuff for the most part. I mean, the sympathetic is important. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's there for a reason. It helps us, you know, fight or, you know, fight or flee in, in cases of danger. But for the most part in today's day and age, most people are living in sympathetic mode, and that's going to, I mean, it's that's really the foundation of a lot of problems, whether we're talking about adrenal fatigue, burnout, anything else. So we want to think about how do we get into parasympathetic, more relaxation on a continual basis, and simple things like just checking in with your breathing. Like, are you breathing from your chest, or are you breathing deep from your belly? And just being aware of that and switching from up to down, like breathing a few times in and out through your belly, can have an instantaneous impact on relaxing your body and going from sympathetic to parasympathetic mode. And not only does that help with that, but it also brings more oxygen into your body, helps you feel more energized. Um, but doing things like meditation, you know, um, yoga are huge for lasting energy because a lot of times the benefit of these activities is that they clear your mind. And I often tell people a cluttered mind basically drains your energy. If you can clear your mind and have a little bit more of a void where you're just kind of in the moments and you're not thinking about a thousand things, there's just less stuff going on. Like it's like a computer that's running a thousand programs. It's going to, it's going to slow down. And that's kind of what, what, what our, what, what our mind is going through. It's like there's a thousand things we need to do. And my challenge for people is to think about how do we get rid of all of that background noise and just calm down and just like, spend a bit more time in a tranquil state because when you're there, your body's natural state is to feel good. It's like a cork. Like you don't, our body's natural state of, of vitality is like a cork floating on water. It naturally wants to float on water. But what we're doing through our daily activity and our lifestyle and our food is we are pulling that cork underwater. So all we have to do is let go of the cork. It'll come right back up to the surface. And that's really what spending more time in tranquility does to our health and our energy. 
be- beautifully said. Now, I, I have two final questions. Uh, one, you know, Yuri, this is kind of like the Cliff Notes version to energy. If somebody mm-hmm. wanted to find out more information through your – what do you have available regarding energy that can help people? Yeah, so I would say the best resource is my book, The All-Day Energy Diets, which is obviously, as the title implies, will give you all-day energy. And it talks, you know, kind of goes on some of the principles we've talked about here. And the second, and again, you can get that at bookstores, Amazon, all that stuff. A uh, second great resource we have is uh, an amazing greens powder. It's a green superfood powder we have called Energy Greens. And it's we believe it's the world's tastiest and healthiest greens powder. It's uh, eight superfoods that are all uh, USA certified organic, uh, vegan, all that good stuff. No junk inside, no excess nonsense, no sweeteners. And it's a really simple way of helping people get more greens, alkalinity, into their body on a daily basis without having to shop, chop, juice, blend, you know, all the messy cleanup. And we call it like the 30 second energy fix because that's really what it is. It takes, you know, less than 30 seconds to be very honest. Um, and they can get that at getenergygreens.com. Cool. That's, that's great. And it's, uh, you just mix it in. It's not a meal replacement. It's kind of something you drink throughout the day kind of deal or. Yeah, exactly. So it's not a meal replacement. It's more of like an alkaline um, in, injection of alkalinity is, I guess, is how I'd put it. So it, like right now I'm drinking a green juice. Um, but if I don't have a green juice or if I'm traveling or if I just want to have something quicker, I'll just add a scoop into water. It tastes absolutely amazing in water by itself. But also we have a lot of really cool recipes that you can use for smoothies with it. And it's uh, it's absolutely delicious. Yeah. Cool. And my my final question is, what is a day in the life of Yuri like from waking up to the end of your day? Uh, help our audience. Uh, how can they set up a day that's going to be productive uh, or at least an example of a productive day to help our audience move forward? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it's something I'm really passionate about talking about and obviously living to the best of my ability. So I've got three boys uh, that are three, four and six years old. So I, I tell people, I'm like, if you want to be really productive, have kids. Like it forces you. <laughs> to, like, you can't mess around anymore. So what I do typically is I'll wake up at about six in the morning and I will spend that first um, couple minutes hydrating myself. So I'll usually get in some water, uh, probably about half a liter of water. And depending on the day, it changes. Like sometimes it'll be lemon water. Sometimes it'll be water with apple cider vinegar. Sometimes it'll be water with diatomaceous earth. Uh, sometimes it'll be water with my greens powder. Um, but first thing in the morning, it's a, a minimum half a liter of water, like just chugging it literally just to get that in. Uh, then I spend about uh, the first hour of my day doing the most important work for me. So I, I typically look at if I only did this one thing today, it would be a success. Like if, you know, if the day totally got away from me and my kids were crazy or whatever it was, as long as I got this one thing done, uh, the day would still be a, a success. So that's the first thing I do. Once I'm done that, I typically take my dogs. I've got two wiener dogs. I take them for about a half an hour walk. And uh, I'm back at the house uh, just about, I guess, 8 o'clock at that point in the morning. And then I'm with my kids for about an hour. We get them to school or to summer camp, depending on what time of year it is. And then from about 9 until uh, 12, I'm doing, again, some more important work. Uh, Workout-wise, I'll usually actually sometimes work out first thing in the morning. If I'm taking my dogs for a walk, I'll squeeze in a half an hour workout after that. Or I'll usually work out around lunchtime depending on the day. And then later in the day, um, afternoon-ish is a little bit more open. So that's where I'll, you know, I'll go play tennis with some, with buddy or, um, I'll take phone calls or interviews or do some just kind of more strategic thinking. That's not too heavily cerebral in terms of creative. Like that's usually where I get my best work done is in the morning. Um, so afternoon's a bit more relaxed. My kids are done school and camp uh, around three to four o'clock. So then basically we pick them up. And then it's uh, family time. And I'm typically in bed by about, I think about 10.30. But the key thing is, before all this, is the key thing to having a great day is planning it the night before. And that's really, really important. If you can get the thinking done, this is the same thing with meal planning. It's the same thing with anything. If you can think, if you can do the thinking before the thinking is required, that's how you're going to win. Because, if, for instance, if you get home after a long day's work and then you're asking yourself what's for dinner, you've already lost. But if you've planned out your meal a day before or a week before, you know exactly what you're having for dinner on Thursday nights, 
you have everything ready, plus subconsciously you know what you're about to embark on. So same thing with planning your day is at least the night before, write down what are the three most important things, or at the very minimum, what's the one most important thing I need to accomplish tomorrow? And if, if you just kind of have that written down, the, the fact of writing it down is massively powerful because now your subconscious mind is programmed to you know, do that thing first thing tomorrow. So that's a really simple thing to do. It'll, it's probably the most impactful thing uh, from a productivity standpoint I've ever implemented in my life, and I've been doing that for more than 15 years now. Wow. I love that answer, Yuri. I do some things very similar to that. I, I'm a big planner. I believe planning equals freedom. So I'm yep. right on target with you, brother. Great, great answer. Any final words, Yuri? Um, I guess like the, just the last thing is like, I mean, there's so much, so much stuff in the world of nutrition and health, so many diets and things and approaches. And at the very, at the, at the end of the day, like you have to just, you have to be your own detective. Like you have to try different things and see what works best for you. You know, just because one diet worked for someone doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Uh, doesn't mean it won't work for you, but you have to try it. You have to see what you enjoy, what you don't enjoy. And at the end of the day, the best thing, the best, if you want to call it a diet, the best diet for you is the one you don't even know you're on. It is just like living life in a way where there's, you're happy, you're joyful, you're, you're, you're enjoying what it is you're doing. If you're eating in a way or living in a way that is fanatical and it's stressing you out, um, I think that's just adding more fuel to the fire. So just do what it is you're doing, do the best you can with what you know, and just take one day at a time, seeking to be a little bit better every single time. And uh, yeah, I think that's a good way to live. Well said. Thank you so much for being on. My name is uh, Dr. Noah DeCoyer, your co-host, and you are listening to the Beyond Your Wildest Dreams podcast. If you'd like what you've heard today, please share this with your friends and encourage them to subscribe on iTunes. Leaving a review is really crucial and helps us move up the charts and helps more people find us. You can subscribe to our incredible weekly email at www.beyondyourwildestgenes.com. And as my oldest son Hayden says, be awesome and never unawesome. <laughs>